Greetings and welcome back. I apologize for the rather long delay, but sometimes the vagaries and vicissitudes of life take hold of you with a vice-like grip, and fortune can be a fickle mistress. But I hope henceforth that I can make these videos on a more regular basis, uh, once a week is my uh, approximate goal. But anyway, today is the beginning of our journey into the history of the English language. And it is, in fact, a pretty epic journey. And I'm not saying that for the sake of hyperbole. But when you consider what we know, what our understanding of the history of English, uh, there seems to be no other word to describe it other than epic. I mean, you have to consider that English began with a small group of disparate tribes approximately 1,500 years ago, and now it's the undisputed lingua franca of the world. And a lot of this has to do with, of course, uh, the unfortunate consequences of colonialism and economic expansion and conquest. Well, it began with conquest, but the simple fact that, uh, that English itself began in an area which uh, amounted to the geographic uh, density and size of, of Denmark, of Jutland, which I'll get to in a bit, and now it is, I mean, the language that everyone speaks in order to communicate. It's, it's quite amazing when you consider that, and whether you're a native speaker or uh, you've acquired English as a second language, the fact that English has acquired the status itself, in my estimation demands some level of interest in its development. I mean, this is originally one of the reasons why I, many, many years ago, set out to understand this. Now, to begin with, uh, as I said in a previous video, English is a Germanic language, and uh, there are many other Germanic languages. Uh, the Romance languages, which came from the Italic languages of Italy originally, specifically Latin, Celtic, Slavic, various languages of India, Iranian, Greek, Albanian. Uh, there are many, many uh, Indo-European languages. We're speaking of the Germanic languages, specifically of the West Germanic language. English is a West Germanic language. And specifically, it belongs to a subgroup of West Germanic called North Sea Germanic. And uh, this group included uh, Frisian, Old Frisian, which is spoken uh, in the northernmost uh, tip of the modern Netherlands and Old Saxon, which was kind of a continental variety of, of English, if you will. Uh, low German, as they call it. And not because it's of lower status, but because of the uh, geography. It's simply uh, the plains of, of northern Germany. There aren't too many mountains up there. And they call it North Sea Germanic for specific, what we say, call phonological reasons, uh, specifically uh, the way vowels and consonants behave, and it really is quite boring if you're not actually interested in the details, so I'm going to skip over that. But suffice to say, English is a West Germanic language, uh, specifically a North Sea Germanic language. It originated from there. And the area, based on our understanding today, of where the so-called Anglo-Saxons and Jews, the tribes that traditionally have been purported to have invaded uh, Britain 1,500 years ago, had come from the area around modern Denmark. Uh, and modern Denmark, historically, was called Jutland. It's, uh, as you know, a, a peninsula, and to a lesser extent from northern Germany and what would be modern Holland, northern Holland or the northern Netherlands. But these, these tribes were not identical. Uh, we generally, in historical linguistics and in history, they're kind of seen as a conglomerate. It's the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes, and they all somehow are one giant people. There are differences between them, but certainly linguistically they're very similar, and culturally as well. And they all come from this small area uh, around northern Germany and the uh, peninsula of Jutland, modern Denmark. And sometime in the 5th century, a bit by bit, they left this area. And there are several reasons for this. One pretty interesting reason is uh, a geological cause. Uh, basically, 
during the late Roman period, there's a geological evidence that suggests that sometime between 250 AD and 650 AD, the, the riverbeds along the coast of the modern Netherlands and northern Germany and, and parts of Jutland were heavily covered in sedimentation. Uh, so much sedimentation that habitation became very, very difficult. Uh, in fact, uh, most of these coastal areas were pretty much uninhabited until roughly the Carolingian era, about 800 AD, uh, approximately the time of uh, Char Charlemagne. And the sea levels as well were uh, significantly higher uh, along those areas uh, additionally. And of course, that also made living in the coastal areas and these uh, areas near the riverbeds quite difficult. So you have a sort of geological reason, uh, uh, literally a, territor uh, a territorial reason, if you will. The, the territory is just unsuitable to living for wanting to leave that area. You know? uh, the other reason, well, there's several. The other reason is pretty simple. I mean, for example, the Saxons at the time were very well known for their seafaring abilities. They were known as excellent seafarers, as pirates as well. So crossing what's now the English Channel, say for the Saxons, and probably for the other groups of Germanic uh, tribes as well, was a child's play, an easy feat, and easily accomplished. And why wouldn't you do that if you were already a seafaring people? And if there were geological or environmental reasons that uh, compelled you to do so, or at least uh, provide an impetus to do so. But generally speaking, the most important reason cited for why the Anglo Saxons and Jutes left the continent for Britain uh, is one based on history or politics. Now, Many of you are familiar with the history of the Roman Empire, and after Caesar had conquered a significant portion of Britain, uh, Britain uh, appro approximately, I mean, it went on for quite some time until the time of Hadrian, between, between roughly uh, 40 BC to, to 120 AD had fallen this is the time of conquest and expansion within Britain it, that was finally ended by the uh, creation, the erection of Hadrian's Wall uh, that's, that's demarcated the, the barrier between what was, was properly considered Roman territory and everything above it. So for several centuries, uh, Britain was considered a Roman province. And... Because of that, there were Roman troops and magistrates and institutions and structures, and they're still all over there. Any of you have ever been to Bath in England, you'll you know the you'll, you'll know about the uh, famous um, baths there. Hence the reason Bath, the way they call it Bath, and they were there for quite some time. I mean, at least three centuries. Now, what you probably also know is that in time the Roman Empire had increasing difficulty in maintaining the status quo. They had overextended themselves, overexpanded on the continent as well as elsewhere, and it was becoming literally impossible to maintain the status quo in the far-flung regions of the empire. Uh, and for the purposes of this argument, the far-flung regions of the empire are places like Britain, because it's on an island, it's quite far away from Rome, um, parts of Mesopotamia, modern, uh, modern, what we would traditionally call Israel, those areas. Basically the areas that hadn't been so penetrated by Roman culture, that they themselves uh, at some point in time did not speak, uh, did not eventually move on to speak some version of a Romance language, which itself, like, such as Italian or French, or uh, Spanish, Portuguese, Romanian, because they had not fallen so stark under the cultural and demographic influence of Rome that they never developed in that direction. We call these the far-flung regions of the empire. What happened was sometime between probably the 380s 
and the very beginning of the 5th century, uh, the Roman Emperor uh, Honorius, he's famous, has written a letter, he, he said to the, Roma, the Romano Britons, as, uh, as they had been referred to, uh, basically, guys, you're on your own. Uh, we need the troops to defend uh, the homestead, Rome, if you will, and, and the more immediate areas of the empire. You know, do what you want. And of course, prior to that, there had been friction. Remember, as I said, uh, Britain had never really, really been Romanized in the same sense that the rest of the continental empire had been. And a lot of it, there was a lot of friction and political tension between the, the Britons who had only been partially Romanized and, if you, for lack of a better word, pure Romans troops and, and what have you that have been posted uh, their magistrates and so on and so forth. So that was another reason. There's a lot of friction there. So eventually they leave. The Romans leave. And there are some problems uh, due to this. They leave in sometime during the 5th century in, in totality. And you might have heard of the Picts. Now the Picts, we, well there are a lot of, I'm not going to go into the Picts, are, are a massive topic. There's some who say they are Celtic in origin, some say they were not, but neither say they were giving the Britons uh, some trouble. Now, some information concerning the Britons. Uh, the Britons are literally the British. Now, the, there were Celtic tribes in the British Isles for quite some time. Uh, the evidence suggests that uh, Celtic tribes settled the island of Britain probably around 500 BC, for, so for several centuries prior to Caesar's invasion in, uh, in the first century BC. And so they had been pretty settled there. And they spoke a Celtic language, uh, probably what we call Proto-British, uh, the, the, the mother, ancient mother language of modern Welsh. And uh, so they were left there. And they encountered problems uh, with, with the Picts. And we have some historical data on this. Um, so two of the major sources of this data, one is a, a British uh, monk or clergyman named Gildas. And Gildas was uh, probably not a very good historian, but he wrote a very important work. It's called uh, De Excidio et Conquestu Britanniae, which is in, in Latin, everyone wrote in Latin back then for the most part which simply means on the ruin and conquest of Britain. And what's unique about his contribution is not so much the quality of his work, because it, this particular work is more a, a sermon and an admonition to the British peoples for their supposed sins in the eyes of God, hence why they were punished by the Anglo-Saxons, but the fact that he wrote in the mid-6th century, probably around you know, 540, 550, 560, making uh, De Excidio on, on the ruin and conquest of Britain uh, by far the earliest work we have on this uh, period of time, which alternatively, of course, is referred to as the Dark Ages. Why? And the reason being that we don't have a lot of data on this topic. The data aren't there. In particular, the data are not there with regards to Great Britain. We simply don't know a lot about what happened then. So you have to kind of take everything that Gilda says with a grain of salt. He's a nationalist, he's also very religious, and a lot of what he talks about has very really little to do with history. But he does talk about the problems that the Celtic tribes had uh, with the Picts and uh, even amongst themselves. And well, interestingly enough, he mentions a uh, descendant of a Roman, or supposedly still Roman, a gentleman by the name of Ambrosius Aureanus, uh, who later becomes King Arthur in, uh, in a fictitious work, a pseudo-history, by a guy named Geoffrey of Monmouth in the 12th century, centuries later in the, a, a work called uh, Histor Historia Regnum Britanniae, the history of the kings of Britain. And this guy, Ambrosius Aureanus, was credited with probably the, the, being the only war leader at the time who for a significant uh, stretch of time, several decades, uh, was credited with the ability of, of having held back the onslaught of Germanic invaders, the Anglo-Saxons. He had sort of uh, pushed it to a halt and was able to 
grab onto some territory and maintain that ter territory for a while. Uh, there's a famous battle, uh, the Battle of uh, Mons Badens, uh, Mons Bada Badicus, uh, which uh, he's famed for uh, winning and pushing back, and, and it, was, it was a decisive mark. Uh, and this took place in the in the sixth uh, century, the early sixth century, in pushing back the the progress of the Anglos and Saxons. But this, of course, was not to uh, remain. The Anglo-Saxons eventually uh, did conquer most of Britain and so as the rest of the work by Gildas is simply uh, a lot of religious admonition and sermons and and what have you. As I said, the most unique contribution that Gildas makes is the fact that he, he happened to live in a period that we don't have a lot of data on, a lot of information, and so the fact that we have a book that stems from probably about 560 or thereabouts is uh, is remarkable in of itself. And the more reliable piece of history comes from a guy you might have heard of, the Venerable Bede. He's often referred to as the father of English history. And he wrote in the 8th century, and he's an Anglo-Saxon, but he is much more reputable. He's generally credited as being uh, much more thorough. He tended to check. I mean, he, he actually wrote a historical work. He uh, is actually credited with uh, checking facts to the extent that one could in the uh, in the uh, the eighth the eighth and seventh century, and checking up on on what's true and what's not. And he wrote a rather monumental work called the Historia Ecclesiastica Gentis Anglorum which is the ecclesiastical history of the English people, the church history of the English people. Now, it's not all that religious, but he gives some specific details uh, as to what happened, what had transpired during the mid-5th century that eventually led to sort of a mass invasion or mass influx of Germanic tribesmen from, from the continent, those areas I described prior. Uh, supposedly, if we were to believe him, a Celtic warlord or chief or king, we don't know his exact, exact position, named Vortigern, uh, invited uh, two leaders uh, from the continent. Uh, these gentlemen, by the, they probably weren't gentlemen, they were probably savages, but I'll refer to them as gentlemen because I like being polite. These gentlemen by the name of Hengus and Horsa, who you might have heard of Hengus and Horsa, the sort of almost mythical figures now, from the continent to help... Uh, battle the uh, or battle back the Picts and according to Bede Hengist and Horsa arrived with their Germanic mercenaries and they were very efficient and they actually helped uh, Vortigern uh, push back the Pictish incursions into what is now England uh, they, I mean, they're coming from Scotland basically and to reward them he said you could have this piece of land but Hengus and Horsa were having, uh, weren't having any of that. In fact, they were thinking some other things. We were thinking, well, these, these Britons, these British are so weak. Why don't we just invite the rest of our friends and buddies from the continent? And we, th I mean, this is great. This is right picking. You have to understand, once again, if you look at the geographical data, as I said it, it, at the time, a lot of that area was uninhabitable. Uh, around the coast of, of Jutland, of northern Germany and northern, and northern Netherlands, and uh, Britain was a pretty fertile land, and there were a lot of opportunities. And so, why wouldn't two ambitious mercenaries, i.e., or or perhaps warlords, I don't know, however you want to term them, say, you know, why don't we just get all of our people over here because the British are weak? And that's pretty much what happened. We don't know the details, but suffice to say. Uh, Hengus and Horsa betrayed Vortigern. He's murdered, according to Bede at least. And what begins there is a conquest uh, that takes place sometime during the mid fifth, begins in the mid in the mid fifth century, about 450, 449. Hengus and Horsa arrive. Probably took a couple of years for them to betray Vortigern, so maybe the uh, late 440s, or sorry, the late 450s. And from then, the conquest goes on and on and on until probably sometime during the 8th century. We don't know exactly when, 
But there is a famous uh, historical monument, if you will. It's called Ofa's Dyke, which was a dyke uh, that was cr built dividing what's essentially modern Wales and the Kingdom of Mercia at the time. Um, sort of almost a line, if you will. And that, that was built during the 8th century, the mid-8th century. And so it's probably a, a good es, es time estimate to have an idea of how long the conquest took in its totality. So give or take uh, three to four hundred years. So that's historically what happened in a nutshell. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of details, some of which are sketchy and some of which are less sketchy. But to give an idea of what happened, that's basically what happened. You had the geological problems on the content, the environmental problems is probably a better description. You have the simple fact that these tribes, Germanic tribesmen, were already very fit at sea and had the ability to sail about uh, quite freely. And you have the fact that the Roman legions had withdrawn uh, back to the continent and Britain was essentially ripe uh, pickings. Uh, add that to the, to the likelihood, not the fact that this guy Vortigern had invited uh, Hengis and Horus and the Germanic mercenaries to uh, to help in pushing back the Pictish incursions. And yeah, you have a situation that leads to the eventual conquest. Now, a little bit more data here, information on the, the Celtic languages. Now, as I said, these are they're not really the original. The original, original, we don't even know what they were. But f about 500 years, uh, more than 500 years before Caesar, in about 44 BC, even uh, even lands on Britain, there had been Celtic tribes there. So they're pretty well established. And they spoke uh, a British language, which of which the descendant Welsh, Cornish, which has been resurrected. And, and those of you who know Breton and Brittany, all descend. They all descend from this language. And what's really interesting about the Germanic conquests is the fact that English throughout its history has been a veritable sponge absorbing vocabulary, what we call lexical items, lexical items refers to vocabulary and linguistics, from other languages into it. And there is such a, a paucity and lack of input from Celtic into English, it's, it's quite astounding. And as, as we proceed through the history of English, we're going to see just how much, uh, how much English has been willing, to the extent that a, a language can be willing and a language can't be, but to absorb all this material from other languages, lexical material, vocabulary. There's almost none of it. Uh, there are a few words that have been borrowed uh, into English from presumably a British, uh, the then British language, which we might call Proto-Welsh or Proto-British or however you want to term it. And they're actually just used to describe uh, geographical phenomenon, phenomena that existed in Great Britain that didn't exist in the marshlands and the lowlands of, uh, of northern Germany and of Jutland. Um, words that you know, they just didn't have, they didn't have any descriptions for it. They borrowed those. But, but by and large, the conquest uh, was pretty thorough. Because, and we know this for that reason, the fact that there's uh, very, very little in terms of borrowings from Celtic in Anglo-Saxon, or in modern English for that matter as well as a derivative of Anglo-Saxon, but also for another reason. Um, you see, we know the way in which the Germanic peoples looked at the Celtic tribes and peoples. If you look at the term Wales and Welsh, Welsh ultimately is derived from an Anglo-Saxon word, Weach. Weach is the Anglo-Saxon word for foreigner, or in a less favorable light, the word for slave. So Wales, literally in English, is the land of foreigners and slaves. 
And this is not an isolate in the sense that for those of you who are familiar with or who happen to be continental Europeans, I'm sure you know the area of Wallonia, the Walloons in southeastern Belgium. That too has the same origin. So does the word walnut. A walnut literally is a foreign nut. Who knows why they called it that? Maybe they'd never encountered it before. Uh, and for example, in the, in the area of, of Walloon, it's used by the Dutch-speaking or the Flemish-speaking people, or had been, to describe the, the foreigners. And for those of you who are German speakers, you're probably, particularly native speakers, you probably know the German word Kodavesh. Kodavesh is the same origin as well. And Kodavesh in German means gibberish, because only foreigners speak gibberish, of course. So we know based on, on that fact alone that the position of the Celtic peoples with respect to the Anglo-Saxon, the Germanic in, invaders, was almost certainly one of subordination, slavery, and assimilation. Those who were not killed outright were likely assimilated into the greater Germanic consensus, if you will, and uh, disappeared uh, into history because of that. Uh, very, very little Celtic input in, in English, uh, any way you stretch it. And that is uh, quite interesting because English has always been very open to, to bor uh, borrowings from other languages. Uh, so, interesting phenomenon there. Now, that's quite a bit on the... Uh, the history. Uh, so let me just finish that off here. By the end of, or rather by the mid 8th century, you have uh, an establishment of about what we call the heptarchy, the Anglo Saxon heptarchy, which comes from the Greek, means the rulership of seven, from uh, heptos seven, or heptos seven. Uh, seven kingdoms, essentially, with each with its own region. You had four main kingdoms and three minor ones. And this will change eventually when the Vikings invade, but that's the subject of another video. And that's you have a more or less peaceable relationship between the, this uh, Anglo-Saxon heptarchy, and that's kind of the state of affairs we have, historically speaking. So that's the history. But the language itself. So what is Old English, and what does it look like? As I said, Old English was a West Germanic, specifically a North Sea Germanic language, and it's very closely related, or was closely related to Old High German, uh, Old Old Dutch, old, very, very closely related to Old Frisian and Old Saxon. And all these languages have certain structures in common. All these languages are inflected. When we talk uh, about inflection in linguistics, inflection means that there are endings, that are added onto words to give them meaning, more often than not to indicate uh, things such as grammatical gender, which I'll get to in a bit, we don't have that in modern English, or positionings, uh, the position of words in a sentence in order to um, describe meaning. In modern English, we use a very rigid and fixed word order to describe uh, to give to basically describe how how the relationships of, of the words in this particular sentence work with each other. Uh, that's not nearly as strict in Old English or in many 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 languages across the world. In fact, there are terms for these in linguistics. We talk about language typologies, and I run the risk of boring you now, but it is kind of important. And there are different kinds of languages. So, you have inflected languages, such as Old English, Latin, Icelandic. You have isolate languages, like modern Chinese, which have almost no inflection whatsoever. Modern English still has some. You have languages called agglutinative languages, or agglutinating languages. And these are languages that seem to be like in, in, inflecting languages. But they add, and rather than just having endings on each word, they keep on adding more and more and more. So basically, you'll start with one word, one word, you add an ending, it means this, and you add another ending, and it all piles up onto each other. 
And there are many, many, many of these types of languages. Turkish is one, Finnish, Hungarian, Korean, Japanese, Mongolian, and these are called agglutinative languages. Then you have uh, synthetic languages, which or, or polysynthetic languages, which are really complicated languages which incorporate all of these things to, to lesser and greater degrees. A lot of the American languages, the Indian, the Native, uh, Native American languages are like this. Inuit is like this. Basque, this strange language isolate in Europe, is like this. But Old English is basically an inflected language. It's not that complicated. But in terms of its morphology, and in linguistics we talk about language morphology to describe the, the, uh, literally the body of the, the words, how they're formed, it's, it's a fair bit more complex than modern English is. And Old English has grammatical gender. It has three grammatical genders. Uh, those of you who don't know languages without, uh, w with grammatical gender or, or only know English, Grammatical gender is not uh, a description of natural gender. It very, very rarely coincides with natural uh, gender. You know, man, woman, these things. It has almost nothing to do with it. But if you've studied a Romance language, which has two genders, or a language such as German or Icelandic, which still has three, you'll know that uh, different words are assigned different genders. So if you take um, the English word stork as an example, uh, there's no gender. Uh, we usually refer to a stork as an it or a he or she, depending on its specific gender. But in French, uh, la cigogne is la cigogne is is feminine. La cigogne is uh, is the stork in French, and it's feminine. But in German, it's der Storch, and it's masculine. Der is the uh, indication that it's mas der Storch, and there's no reason for this whatsoever. And the word for child. In German is neuter, das Kind. A neuter me means neither feminine nor masculine. And Old English had all three of these categories. So does modernized uh, modern Icelandic. Uh, each word, each noun, was assigned a grammatical gender. And in learning a language like this, if you're not a native speaker, you generally have to memorize it and look for patterns. And there are patterns often, for example, in German and French, but that's neither here nor there. This, this is not a, a language lesson, rather a description of how of how Old English worked and what it looked like. And yes, there are three grammatical genders in Old English. The other thing that uh, differentiates Old English quite a bit from modern Engl English is the case system. Now, in, in linguistics and studying language, a system of cases is often used to describe the morphology, the body of the words itself. Cases are indications of the functions of specific words in a given sentence and in a given structure, a set of structures. So for example, we have a subject case or an object case, an indirect object case. And traditionally, these are referred to in Western cult culture using Latin gram grammatical terms. So a subject case is called a nominative. A possessive case is called a genitive. A, 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 dir a direct object case is called an accusative. An indirect object case, a dative, and so on and so forth. Uh, those of you who know German, once again, there are still four cases in German as there are in modern Icelandic. Although German indicates most of the cases by using articles. In Icelandic, it's still a lot more complex. You have adjective endings. You have that in German as well, to a lesser extent and so on and so forth. And these indicate the relationship uh, of words uh, in a sentence. So modern English, uh, not having this as, well, it ha modern English has these cases as well. Every language in theory has these cases, but we don't have actual uh, changes to either the article or the endings of words to indicate, indicate this. Let me give you some examples of this. Now, you don't need to know Latin. I'm going to be showing you how this works to understand this. So if you take a really simple Latin sentence, and Latin has six cases, a heavily inflected language, for example, this sentence, do rosas feminae, I give roses to the woman, literally, I give roses to the woman, well, that seems like a perfectly okay uh, sentence, right? You have do, which is I give, rosas, roses, 
feminae to the woman. But in English, the word order here is very strict. Because, you, you, because we don't have these endings, we are limited to a very strict word order. It's impossible for us to rearrange words without coming out with gibberish or just mangling English grammar completely. But in Latin and other languages which are inflected, this is not uh, a requirement. So if you look at this version of the same sentence, it means the same thing, it means the same thing, rosas feminae do, rosas feminae do, roses to the woman I give, it means the same thing. Or what about this one? Feminae do rosas, to the woman I give roses. Or finally, uh, this example, feminae rosas do, to the woman roses I give. All these sentences mean exactly the same thing, the only difference is in emphasis. And as you see, the endings highlighted, these endings in a Latin sentence will tell you what belongs where and what the relationship of certain words is to other words. In this case, rosas is a feminine plural accusative, a direct object. Feminae is a feminine dative singular, an indirect object. And do is I give. So I give roses to the woman. We don't have that flexibility in modern English. Latin did. And to a somewhat lesser extent, Old English did as well. Uh, Old English had a, a much more flexible system uh, than, not, than does modern English, although not quite as flexible as Latin. So looking at some Old English examples to get an idea of word order and how, the, how that worked, you have these endings as well. So if you take this sentence in Old English, tha uh, theoas yivath tham kuningu sword. The servants give the king the sword. Seems like a perfectly respectable sentence in modern English, but you can twist that around quite a bit. That sword yivath tham kuningu thas theoas. The sword give to the king the servants. Now the here it's less so the endings, but we what we call determiners, the the articles for lack of a better word that are telling you what belongs where. And the same thing would be the case in modern German. Or what about this version of the sentence? Tham kuninge yivath tha theoas that sweot. And that means to the king give the servants the sword. And But the, the core meaning, the original meaning, the servants give the king the sword, uh, that is the basic meaning. And it doesn't really change. Only the emphasis change, changes here. And this is because of the various endings there. Now, a little bit on the, the strange letters you might see there. That is, I've described, I might have mentioned this before, thorn. This uh, strange kind of P-looking or weird thing with the X on top. That is a th sound. Th, what we call in linguistics a, uh, a, dental, a dental fricative. And I won't, but that's not really relevant. It's, it's a th sound, depending on its position uh, in a given word. And uh, G... The G sound in Old English, if it's followed by certain vowels, is not a G, but a Y. So, for example, the word, the word Old English word for, for yield is yieldan, but it's written with a G. But it's pronounced yield, just like it is in modern English. So, this is, gives you an idea of how Old English worked. It had... A pretty inflected, that is, there are these words, uh, these bits of, of meaning that you kind of added onto words or you in the form of articles or endings. And uh, that basically allowed speakers of Old English to decode what was going on. We don't, we've lost that for the most part in modern English. We actually still do have cases to a much more limited extent in modern English. I won't bore you that with, uh, with the details on that right now, but that's how that worked. And if you look at the actual individual words, some of it, of course, is pretty foreign. I think most of you can identify the word uh, yifath. Yifath, uh, give, is a conjugated verb here. It's actually not the origin. It's not our give. Our give, and I'm going to be making an entire video about this, uh, is actually Old Norse. It comes from the Vikings, uh, which it eventually supplanted or replaced the Old English yifan, which was to give. But you can still see... I mean, certainly, theowas has, theowas has died out, the serv which was a word that meant servant, theowa. But kuninge, king, you probably recognize that. There, that, that, 
that's the word that. Sword uh, is sword, and so on and so forth. So you, know, you can certainly see some of these things. And if you look at the uh, Lord's Prayer in Old English, which is always a good example, uh, which I'll read out briefly. Father ur thuthea ert on heophonum, si fin nama ye halgod, tu becum fin riche ye worth fin wille, an eorvan swa swa on heovan, urna ye de huam lichan hlaf sil us today, an for yif us ur giltas swa swa we for give urum giltendum. O ne ye led thu us an kostnunge ak, alu, ak alus uf oth ul ufele solige. My old English is a bit rusty, so there's an idea of how it kind of sounds, more or less. We don't know exactly how it sounded since there are no native speakers left. And even here, it seems a bit odd, but you can recognize some words. So heophonum has this weird ending, which is a dative. It's an indirect object. It has a preposition, that's why. But it's still the same word, heophon, is, is heaven. Then you have uh, fader, uh, which is fader is, is father. Uh, ur, our, ur, our, nama, name. Yehalgod uh, is, is related to the word holy. Bukum, uh, become, to become. Uh, Willa, will, eorthan, earth. Swa is the same word as so, modern English so, as in so I did this. Uh, but the, the W sound was dropped eventually. Uh, even the word hlaf, hlaf is actually the word loaf. And today, well, it's self explanatory today. For yiv, to forgive. Gultas, or sins, but it means guilt. We have the word guilt in modern English. And ufele uh, is evil at the bottom. And then soth soth you might know the somewhat archaic expression for sooth. Soth used to be truth in uh, in Old English. And so you see, it's not that foreign. It's mostly the grammar, although we've lost a lot of the vocabulary throughout the ages because of borrowings. And despite this, the battery, the bulk of the most important words uh, in modern English, the prepositions, the really basic vocabulary, the pronouns, you know, I do this, that's an all built, of, if I say the sentence, if I didn't say the sentence, I do this, that that sentence is all Old English. It's about 80% of these really common basic words are still words that uh, originally go back to this uh, point in time of Old English and have their origin there. Now, on a final note, uh, at the risk of boring you to death, and hopefully no one passes prematurely because of it, there's another interesting thing about Old English, uh, which might help people learning or wanting to learn Germanic languages. So, you've probably heard of the term irregular verb. Uh, or those of you who've learned English or German or any uh, or Dutch or any of these Germanic languages, they'll use this term irregular verb, regular verb. Now. This is a pedagogical tool. This, these verbs are not actually regular or irregular. These are not the correct uh, definitions and descriptions. So if you have a word in modern English such as see, saw, seen, take, took, taken, drink, drank, drunk, these will be described in textbooks and pedagogical books as irregular verbs. And similarly, if you have uh, verbs such as lift, lifted, lifted, walk, walked, walked, or fax, fax, faxed, these will be called regular verbs. But th this is not the correct terminology, technically speaking. In historical linguistics, these are called Germanic strong verbs, the so-called irregular ones, verbs like sing, sang, sung. And regular verbs such as type, typed, typed, are called weak verbs. And that's probably more uh, re for reasons of convention. That's how they just come to have been called uh, throughout the ages. But the major distinction here is that uh, these all follow regular patterns. Now, a strong verb, i.e. irregular verb, follow, follows a pattern that in German, there's sort of a universal term called umlaut. But that means uh, vowel gradation. That means that the, the, the time, the tense, will change 
uh, due to changes in the vowel quality. So you see that in a verb such as drink. I drink, I drank, he had drunk, something along those lines. You see the, cha the changes, and it's the vowel change itself that indicates whether we're talking about the present or the past. Whereas in a so-called weak verb, a regular verb, such as facts or typed, you have a suffix, a consonant suffix, which you add to that. And these actually follow very specific patterns. In modern English, it's become pretty chaotic because we've lost a lot of the original patterns. But in Old English, there are about 300 of these strong verbs. And considering that modern English only has 70, give or take, we've lost a lot. Uh, modern German has between 170 and 180, and uh, modern Icelandic still has about 260 to 280 of them. So all Germanic languages have these so-called strong verbs and weak verbs, and all of them, the, all the regular uh, weak verbs are, are created in the past tense using a so-called so consonant uh, suffix to create that meaning. And as you can see, here, there are this neat little chart. The Old English verbs are further classified into different classes of strong verbs. There are seven classes in total. Classes one through six, as you can see, follow ex very regular patterns. The only irregular class, the only group of verbs that could be properly called irregular is class seven, which just varies, and it has a, that's why it has its own class. But they all have follow a certain pattern. So. In class one, you have a long e sound, and then two and two, two is ao, three is uh, is three a. The different their subcategories is i or ao, and so on and so forth. Then you have past singular and past plural. The old Germanic languages distinguish the past and modern Icelandic as well. The past uh, singular and the past plural. So if you had uh, for example, in Old English, uh, to say, I drank, you would say, uh, itch, I itch, drank. But if you wanted to say, we drank, you would say, uh, we drunkon. So it, 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 you would have a difference in the past plural. In, the, in modern English, in modern Dutch, in modern German, this is all melded into one giant conglomerate. We just have one past, uh, one change in the vowel for all the past. There is one exception here. You probably know it, the verb to be. I was, but we were. And that's true in German as well, and Dutch as well. So there, that's the only one, uh, example in which modern, in modern Germanic language is where this is preserved. And of course we have the, the participle which is uh, different, the participle uh, being the, such as I had drunk or the drunk man, sometimes it's used as an adjective. These all follow these, this uh, nice little pattern here. And here are just various examples of, of basically what I'm talking about, these various classes. And you'll probably recognize a lot of these, looking at this, a lot of these, uh, these, these verbs in modern English, though not all of them. And if you know German, you'll recognize even more of them. So, for example, Sneedan, Sneedan to cut, is, is German, corresponds to German Schneiden. Uh, beliefern, we don't have that in modern English, but in German you have Bleiben, to stay. Uh, and the list goes on and on. Schienan. Then if you look at class two, Cheosan, which is choose, you probably recognize that. Kreopan, creep. Creep used to be a strong verb. It's not anymore. Remember, it's crept. It does sound different, but it still has that consonant suffix, which changes, uh, which which changes because of the other consonants in that particular verb. But it's a weak verb now. Um, you can see, for example, to lose in the form of forleozan, lose. All these are irregular. Here's an example in class three of. A verb that used to be strong in English, helpan, which became weak in modern English. In Eng modern English, we say, uh, I helped, you helped, they have helped. But in German, it's still a strong verb. Uh, ich helfe, 
ich half, sie haben geholfen. Right? So, uh, English has lost a lot of these. And if you look through, you can recognize many of them. But they all ultimately follow uh, regular patterns for the most part, with the exception of class 7, which is a relatively small class and can be learned and memorized. Understanding this, what happened here in English and all these languages is what we call leveling. Leveling in historical linguistics and linguistics in general refers to the reduction in specifically morphological complexity, meaning the the basically the shapes of the words. Things become simpler over time, and there are reasons for this, which I might cover in a, in a video at the future, in a future at a future date. And what happens is that these uh, these strong verbs, so-called irregular verbs, be, uh, become weak verbs over time through a process by means of a process we call analogical leveling. Analogical leveling, which you'll be hearing a lot in future videos, describes the process of creating a weak verb from a strong verb, or for that matter, any kind of word in general. It doesn't have to be, it could be a noun as well. But in this case, it's, it's verbs, because that's the predominant pattern. There have always been more weak verbs, that is, verbs that formed a past tense with a consonantal suffix as opposed to vowel gradation, than there have been strong verbs. And so it's a natural tendency for the Germanic language to create more uh, weak verbs over time than strong verbs, because quite frankly, it's it's easier. Uh, children, when acquiring any language, uh, use analogical leveling uh, all the time. Remember, children do not learn. Learning language is a, kind of a suspicious term. When children acquire language, that's what they do. They do all kinds of things. So you might hear an English native speaking child say something like, "I go to the uh, to the film," as opposed to "I went to the film," and that's perfectly fine. And why? Because, well, that's analogical leveling right there. That It makes sense to add a consonant suffix to create the past tense, because that's how you do it with most verbs in English, and indeed most verbs in German uh, as well. In fact, uh, with in modern English and modern German, with one or two exceptions, every verb, new verb that enters the language, to facts, for example, to... to message someone. I mean, these will always, always, always be uh, so-called regular or or weak verbs. Uh, there's a simple reason for this that I'll briefly go into, is think of the brain as a language computer, uh, sort of a giant computational system. Now, look at language complexity, and this is the trend in all languages to simplify over time as uh, taking up a uh, hard drive, if you will, in the brain. As time goes on, uh, human beings have a natural tendency to reduce the complexity uh, of the morphological, sometimes the phonological, the sound system, and so on and so forth, the complexity of that language, because ultimately, and it's put it, putting it very simplistically, that reduces the amount of hard drive the language is uh, taking up in the brain. And this is a natural tendency in all languages. So anyway, that's more in a nutshell. I mean, there's, I could probably do a hundred videos on old English because it's a massive topic. But I just want, I mean, for people who don't know about this kind of stuff, you know, what does old English look like? Uh, how was it spoken a bit? What were the structures that made it old English as opposed to modern English? Hopefully, that gives you an idea of just what it was. Uh, and the next video, uh, if the gods favor me with time, hopefully they will will be about the influence of the Vikings, Old Norse on Old English. It'll be hopefully shorter. Um, props to, uh, kudos to those who've been able to sit through this. And uh, yeah, so hopefully that was interesting at the very least and you enjoyed it. Uh, it's difficult to make the, this an exciting topic because generally speaking the consensus is that it's not. But that's basically Old English in a nutshell. A bit of the history and a bit of how it all looks. So thanks for watching. Uh, if you like this, please uh, hit the like button. And those of you who are first encountering this ch channel, I would very much appreciate a subscription. And I'm looking forward to the comments and views. And uh, hopefully, like I said, we'll have something up uh, fairly soon. Everyone, 
uh, take care, and may the gods watch over you. And finally, 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 before I forget, let me thank uh, Lord Kreathor, who uh, made that nice uh, banner and uh, an image portrait of the uh, indeterminate vagabond. Thank you very much. He's an excellent artist, and uh, he's a high lord of Czechoslovakia as well. So everyone take care, and see you soon.